So hi there. I just want to say hello and introduce myself if we haven't met before. My name is Dr. Karen Trainer, and I run Innovative at Path. I'm based in Kansas, but I read cases and DermPath cases for clients all over the country, and I even consult internationally. And today I'm going to present to you an exciting case from uh, deep in the heart of Texas. It's a case from a young cat, and then we'll go into a case series with some more examples uh, afterwards. So I am going to um, share with you uh, this presentation uh, of this case. We'll get that up running. Now, hopefully, and just to get you oriented, uh, today's case is uh, her name is Honey, and she is a three and a half year old female spay domestic short hair cat. And she is, um, these clinical photos are provided courtesy of Dr. Janice Daigle, um, who is the dermatologist on the case. And she sent me sensational pictures, and we're going to go through Honey's story. So uh, Honey, she had a history of facial rubbing that started when she was very young. A uh, mass was noted on the left ear in around 2018, 2019, according to the owner. Uh, and then lesions spread on her ears and she developed nasal congestion around the end of 2019, maybe 2020. And you can see here on the pinna, all along the margin, there's a lot of thickening. And this erythemic, semi-crested, uh, swollen appearing mass effect is all along the margin of the pinna here. So that's some of the lesions that we're uh, presenting, uh, she presented with. And she was seen by an internist in September of 2020 at another clinic. And uh, one of their differentials was cryptococcus. So they had done a cryptococcus antigen test, which was negative. Then they did a CT scan and rhinoscopy. And then they cultured uh, her nasal passages and grew pastorella. This is another example of one of her penna. This is um, her eye over here, her whiskers, her tongue, uh, her body is going this way. So we're looking at her left penna um, and this is one of the lesions. This one's a little bit more moist. You can see it's eroded, not ulcerated. Um, there is uh, all this erythema and then the swollen appearance to it. It's creating a, a mass effect. So they had done some biopsies previously from the nasal passages, and the findings were nonspecific. Uh, there is, within the connective tissue stroma, contained moderate numbers of mixed inflammatory cells. Interestingly, they were lymphocytes, plasma cells, neutrophils, and scattered eosinophils. And they said a specific infectious etiology or malignant neoplastic process was not identified. The diagnosis was pleocellular rhinitis with congestion, hemorrhage, and mucinous material. So this is what her nose appeared like. Uh, you can see how swollen it is. And there's also lesions extending up along the bridge of the nose. The cat now has numerous nodules on the left pinna, raised ulcerated scab lesions on the nasal planum, and the tail tip and proximal tail as well are also affected. The nares are ulcerated and stenotic. You can see how small the openings are here. And she has severe nasal congestion. So cytology of the scab lesions, because you could see how uh, raw some of these were, showed uh, numerous cocci bacteria and pyogranulomatous inflammation. So the differential diagnoses uh, for, for these lesions were sporothrix, cryptococcus, histoplasmosis, histiocytic disease, cutaneous lymphoma, possibly an allergic process, or something else. Um, so we'll get into that. So I'm going to uh, share with you uh, the, the scan slide. So we'll pull that up. Uh, and OK. So. This is uh, one of the biopsies from honey's, uh, from the, the bridge of the nose from honey. 
And already at low power, we can see that there is a massive inflammatory trait. Uh, all the way, so from what we can tell here, this is what's left with epidermis. So all the way from the superficial dermis down to the deep aspect of the biopsy and from edge to edge, there is a diffuse uh, inflammatory infiltrate, just sheets and sheets of inflammatory cells. And then we can also see, I'm going to zoom back out. We can also see where the epidermis here is intact going along, going along, and then it disappears. This is, uh, there are areas on these biopsies of erosion and then ulceration as well. So this is a beautiful biopsy from the margin of an ulcer, which is what we, uh, we love to see in derm path. So this is the perfect way to biopsy an ulcerated lesion uh, right at the margin. This is exactly what we're looking for. So uh, let's take a closer look at what's going on with this inflammatory infiltrate. So you might appreciate that there's a lot of clear spaces that are popping up. And then as we look a little closer, there's a lot of purple dots, uh, blue purple dots all scattered throughout. And they're especially concentrated in the clear spaces. So uh, What's going on with that? Let's also take a look at some of the inflammatory cells. So if we look over here, uh, certainly let's start with ones that are easiest to identify. Uh, it comes into focus. So we've got you know a, a mix of macrophages. These are the large cells with all of the cytoplasm and these clear spaces within them. These are by far the most numerous. So these are macrophages, and then we also have some scattered neutrophils within here. Uh, we also have a mix of plasma cells. These are the cells that have the perinuclear clearing next to the nucleus. This is called the Golgi ghost or a Golgi body, uh, Golgi apparatus. Uh, that's what we're seeing there. Uh, we'll go and look in some other areas to see uh, some of the inflammatory cells. Oh, this is a good spot. Let's take a look at this. So uh, other cell types that we're seeing, we're seeing large clusters of eosinophils. So that's an interesting finding. Uh, we've got now macrophages, we've got neutrophils, plasma cells, eosinophils, and there are some lymphocytes scattered in here as well. Those are the cells that are uh, much smaller. They have very little cytoplasm um, and uh, a large round blue nucleus. Um, so what we're seeing here is a whole mix of inflammatory cells. And uh, the interesting thing is we're also finding some Russell bodies. So these are plasma cells that you can think of them as constipated plasma cells. They're filled with uh, um, globules of, uh, uh, with, filled with globulin within the cytoplasm. And those are an indication of chronic antigenic stimulation. So that's a, a classic finding you'll see with very, very chronic inflammation once you start getting all these plasma cells in here. And it's important to note that eosinophils in this inflammatory mix because what are eosinophils associated with most often? We most classically associate eosinophils with uh, parasitic diseases and uh, allergic diseases, and perhaps things like mast cell tumors. Uh, this is another uh, uh, plasma cell uh, with Russell bodies within the cytoplasm, um, just to show you how they, they do keep popping up. So uh, on that list of differentials, uh, it, it's important to note that uh, a parasitic option could be considered because uh, that was one of the, the open-ended questions with something else other than those. So certainly um, my radar starts to go up and I start thinking, because uh, you can certainly see eosinophils with fungal diseases, but not quite as common. The other type of infectious disease that we see eosinophils with would be something like pithiosis, and that you would expect more in say a horse or in some dogs, they're exposed to standing water. Um, that can have a very similar appearing um, mix of inflammation with eosinophils and uh, granulomatous, pyogranulomatous inflammation as well. 
Okay, so what are all of these structures? That's really what is the main attraction. And they're everywhere. They're just all over the place. Um, so these are amastigotes, and they are measuring about two to four microns in diameter. And we'll zoom in closer. And you can almost, if you imagine, you can almost see that they have a little dark purple nucleus within them. So that is one way that we can identify this organism. And then there's another interesting feature, and it's called a parasitocris vacuole. And that's what all these clear spaces are that we're looking at. So this round circular structure within the cytoplasm of a macrophage is called a parasitocris vacuole. And this is what protects the amastigotes from the immune system and allows them to proliferate and hide out and just grow uh, uh, without, without consequence from the immune system. So these are all of the amastigotes and note how they sort of cling to the margin all around the perimeter. They're scattered all around the periphery of this parasitocris, parasitocris vacuole. And so this is something that's very unique that Leishmania does, Leishmania mexicana. This is a cutaneous form of Leishmaniasis. There are different types of Leishmania. Uh, cutaneous forms, cutaneous, visceral, um, and this is one of the varieties that causes cutaneous lesions. Leishmania mexicana uh, does not cause uh, visceral lesions typically, classically. Anyway. Um, so that's what we're seeing here. This is just another example of one of these parasitocris backwolves, and see how those amastigotes are all lined up uh, and pretty tightly adhered around the, the periphery of that vacuole. So that's something that's a very unique feature. So on that whole long list of differentials, seeing the eosinophils is a clue to start thinking parasitic, and then seeing these parasitocorous vacuoles and, and how the amastigotes are marching it all around the edge. Uh, those are two features on the h &E that really uh, give a strong indication to start thinking about Leishmania. And then look at this macrophage nucleus. Uh, this is something that I see and I'm sure other folks have seen uh, on, on biopsies from cats. When I see really activated macrophages with a variety of different types of inflammatory responses, I see the chromatin gets a little bit more, more finely evacuated, but the nucleolus becomes much more prominent. Um, you can see it's pretty gigantic. Um, and so I just think that's a very interesting finding. It, it almost looks perhaps neoplastic uh, if you weren't sure what you were looking at. Um, but sometimes when you do see an infectious agent or you just see a lot of inflammation going on, it's just something uh, to be aware of that these really activated macrophages can have these really gigantic nuclei that are very prominent. Um, so I think they're just interesting to note. All right, so that is the h &E. And so we can just see widespread wall-to-wall -wall inflammation as far as we can see, um, lots of erosion, ulceration on the surface, and then look at, at how uh, sparse the adnexal structures are. See how they are spared from the inflammation. They are not the primary target. This is an apocrine gland here, or was formerly known as an apocrine gland. And so they are largely spared by the inflammation. They are not the target of it. These inflammatory cells are all throughout the dermis and the interstitial. So that's uh, something else to note. Uh, let's see, take a look at another one of these files. So here we can get a little bit better sense of, of the fact that this is haired skin. This is from one of the pinna. Um, and we can see here's the intact epidermis at the surface covered by all of the serocellular crust. And then remember on cytology, they saw lots of bacteria. And that's because this surface is so ulcerated, it is covered with lots of bacteria in here. Um, and so there's a lot of serocellular exudate on the surface. This is a very wet, messy lesion, um, but there, there is uh, quite a bit of bacteria that is scattered throughout uh, on the surface on some of these slides. And then again, just this very similar inflammation. Just look at all of these parasitocris vacuoles, all of these amastigotes everywhere. And if we take a closer look, 
you you can uh, appreciate there's a, a subtle dark blue purple appearing structure within some of them, and that is the nucleus of the aster. So we'll we'll just take a little bit uh, of another look at some other areas. Uh, we can see how inflamed the surface is. Uh, that's why it has such a, a moist uh, appearance to it because it is so ulcerated. Um, and so then let's get back to our story. All right, so uh, this is the GMS stain because remember uh, on that whole list were things like sporotrichosis, histoplasmosis, cryptococcosis, all of those organisms we would expect to be positive uh, with a GMS or a PAS state. So this is the GMS and we can see that this is again, the wall to wall inflammation. We can see these structures, these are staying with the counter stain with the GMS, the green counter stain, but they're not taking up the silver. So this is a negative result. Uh, and so that tells us that it's not a fungal organism, which helps us uh, gain stronger uh, evidence that this is most likely leishmaniasis. And this is a gamesis stain. And this does stain the amastigotes. And I took this uh, using a 100X oil um, because I wanted to show you right here, this is one of the amastigotes and here's the nucleus. And I, I'm gonna ask you to, to trust me here on this one, but I'll show you some other images. Uh, but there is also a structure here, and this is called the kinetoplast. And that is perpendicular uh, to the nucleus. And uh, I'll show, I'm gonna go through a case series that I had done for my residency about this condition. And I'll, I'll show you some of the cytology and how the organism appears. And so you can get a little bit better sense uh, because I know it's, it's a difficult diagnosis to make and it's a little bit hard to see some of the structures. So this was a, a case series that I, I worked on with colleagues uh, at Texas A&M. Uh, and this is a project that I worked on during my residency. And uh, just to give you a, a bit of background about this condition. So I thought I would share it with you uh, with on your case. So cutaneous leishmaniasis, CL, has been reported in cats from Europe and South America. And it had been reported previously from one cat in Texas back in 1984. And then we had this series of about eight cats over the course of um, several years. And um, these cats all were uh, diagnosed ultimately with Leishmaniasis. And the type of the subspecies was Leishmania mexicana. And this variant is uh, one of the variants that causes cutaneous lesions rather than visceral or mucocutaneous. And it is endemic in Texas. So this is important to note because a lot of people either aren't aware of this um, or, or haven't seen it before because there was just that, that single case report in the literature uh, from way back when. So what's interesting is that over the last few decades since uh, that original report in CAT, there have been at least 30 cases diagnosed in humans. Uh, there's been many more since then. Uh, this was a uh, uh, project from uh, 2008. So this is, this is kind of uh, old, so things have progressed a bit since then. Um, but they, they identified the agent. Um, uh, it, it was only found in, in one previous case uh, before this series. But since this, the time that this was uh, published in 2010, uh, many more cases have been diagnosed, and I know colleagues from many other labs have diagnosed this, and I'm sure have seen this as well. Um, and, and maybe some of the clinicians out there have seen this too. Uh, but classically, the diagnosis is made by cytology or histopath, but I have to yield the floor here to cytology. Normally, I like to think of biopsy as the ultimate for getting answers and being the most definitive. Uh, and while in most cases that is true, uh, on this point, on this diagnosis, cytology is actually uh, preferable to see the morphology of the organism. Um, and I'll show you that in just a moment. Um, you can do serology. That's um, probably something that's more common with the visceral forms of Leishmania. Uh, this is more commonly done. Um, you can culture the organisms, but it's very difficult and takes quite a long time. 
um, and you have to suspect it to begin with. Um, and then you can also detect the parasite DNA using PCR. And this is considered the gold standard to make the diagnosis. And you can do this using tissue blood or biopsy samples, uh, formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue. And the biopsies from our uh, case series were uh, from eight cats and they were evaluated over a three and a half year period. The median age was interestingly three years old and the cats ranged in age from one to 11 years. The chief complaint was nodular ulcerative lesions on the pinna, muzzle and uh, the facial regions. And it's unknown though, if some of them were indoor, outdoor or um, what their FBLB, uh, FIB status was. And so these images, um, I would also note, this is uh, uh, not one of the images from our uh, studies. I, I have to look up the reference for this. I have to go back and find that. I, I don't have that, but I want to make sure that someone gets credit for that. So I'll, I'll put that in the comments as well. Um, this is a series of images that are from a paper that, that's much more recent from 2018 clinical and diagnostic aspects of feline cutaneous leishmaniasis in Venezuela. And you can see these are some very dramatic lesions. Uh, these are also involving uh, the nose, there's uh, ulceration, crusting, uh, mass effect sort of lesions, uh, very you know, swollen appearance on the bridge of the nose. Um, this cat also has lesions on the paw, uh, so on the extremities as well. Um, so this is, uh, um, excellent paper uh, and has fantastic images. Um, and so this is a subgross image from one of the cats in our study. And just to get you oriented, this is from the penna. So these are the cartilage plates that you would expect to see in the penna. And then remember how we were seeing all those swollen lesions on honey on her ear all along the ear margin. Uh, this is what it looks like in cross section, how uh, this bulbous sort of swollen. Um, and some of the lesions were, again, here's the cartilage plate from the pinna of a, of a different cat. And we can see there's lots of ulceration. There's probably a, a superficial bacterial pyoderma here. And then just wall to wall inflammation, just like we saw in Hunt's biopsies, all the way from the superficial to the very deep dermis. And then lots of uh, darker inflammatory cells. So th that's where we would tend to find the eosinophils lymphocytes, plasma cells around the blood vessels within the dermis. And here again, here's a closer look now. So here are sheets and sheets of these macrophages uh, with these gigantic parasitocorous spacules filled with amastigotes, just filled to the brim, lots of plasma cells and lymphocytes. And then we also see um, a smattering of neutrophils and occasional eosinophils. And this is another view just showing uh, higher magnification. This is on 100x oil showing the amastigotes uh, inside of the parasitocorous vacuoles. And again, remember how we talked about those macrophages, gigantic nucleolus and the, uh, the sort of vesicular patterns of chromatin. Uh, this is a gene sustain. This is uh, again with these activated macrophages, but it's highlighting these amastigotes. And here we get in perfect uh, uh, a view of the perpendicular kinetoplast and the nucleus. That's exactly what we're looking for uh, with the gene sustain. That's what it's going to show us and confirm for us the diagnosis. And this is uh, the differential staining pattern of how this looks. So this is HME, then this is GIMSA. This up here on the top right is the GMS. You can see how there's no staining uptake. And then this is the PAS. It's all pink. We're not seeing any um, deep magenta staining. So for contrast comparison, since we're talking about uh, other agents, just so you can see how they would look if they were stained with the GMS, this is how a positive uh, GMS stain would look for cryptococcus. So this is what it looks like on the h &E, the large, the classic soap bubble appearance. And then uh, here are the organisms on GMS. You can also do a mucic carmine stain, which is quite beautiful. And I did not have time to put uh, an example of that in, but I can show you that another time. Um, 
but this is what cryptococcus looks like. So that would be another differential. And that's why they've done the cryptococcus antigen. And this is what histoplasmosis looks like. And you can see uh, the mix of inflammatory cells here. It looks quite similar. There's lots of macrophages, but then we also have some neutrophils, maybe even an eosinophil or two. Uh, we've got some plasma cells and uh, lymphocytes all throughout here. So quite a similar mix. And it, you could almost imagine, perhaps, that maybe some of these clear spaces within the macrophages could be parasitocorous backbones. It certainly looks very similar. But when we do the GMS stain, we do get positive staining for the organisms. They take up the silver. Whereas with the Leishmania, it did. So here is what I was referring to with respect to the cytology, where it just far and away uh, is easier to see the orientation of the, uh, these, this is a, a macrophage and these are erythrocytes all around. And then these are free amastigotes, uh, extracellular. And this is a gigantic macrophage stuffed, just absolutely stuffed with tons of amastigotes. And then these are the little structures. They're two to four microns in diameter. And then they have a nucleus and a kinetoplast. And so here's the nucleus and a kinetoplast perpendicular to it. And this is an even tighter shot showing two amastigotes next to each other. The more magenta structure is the nucleus. The darker blue, almost purple structure that is perpendicular to the nucleus is the comedoplast. So the way you can remember this, there's another type of a, uh, a mastigote organism uh, that has a comedoplast in the nucleus and that's trypanosomiasis. So trypanosoma cruzi, uh, for example, uh, and that, in that organism, the kinetoplast is parallel to the nucleus rather than perpendicular. And the way that I remember that um, is that trypanosome PA is parallel PA. And Leishmania is perpendicular because when you make the letter L, uh, you draw the lines, they're perpendicular, and the orientation of the kinetoplast to the nucleus is perpendicular. Um, so this, we had done PCR analysis and extracted the DNA from the formalin fixed parasympathetic tissue. And we uh, were able to show that it aligned 100% with Leishmania mexicana amazonensis. And then this is just to show how it's color-coded over time to show where these cases uh, in our study developed. Uh, and you can see how it's spread, it's starting to spread northwards over time. And this is the Dallas-Fort Worth area, metro area, and then up here is the border with Oklahoma. And so as of around um, 2008, it was already up to the Dallas metro area. And so who knows how much further it will extend, but the vector for this uh, agent for Leishmania is the sandfly Lutsamaya, which is in Texas. And the reservoir host is the burrowing wood rat, this little, this little, uh, Gal here. So um, these are the organisms, and the, that's part of the life cycle. And they are present uh, all throughout Texas and, and possibly spreading into other states. So it is possible to see this uh, in other locations. So I think this is an important differential diagnosis to keep on your list, particularly if you're in uh, these areas. So this is the paper that we published. Uh, as a result of, of this case series. Um, this was in that path. Um, and so it just has a little bit more uh, information if you're interested. But Leishmania mexicana, the bottom line, is endemic in the US. So uh, it's good to keep it on your list of differential diagnoses, particularly if you see any sort of a nodular or granulomatous dermal lesion in a cat. Um, with histopath, it can be really identified. It's difficult to identify that ketoplast. Um, and cytology is really the best to, uh, to see the morphology, but it can also be difficult because the lesions are so ulcerated. You may just get the bacteria on the surface. So that could skew uh, your results and, and perhaps lead you down a different path. Um, if you were to do cytology, I'd recommend doing an aspirate um, and trying to get deeper in the tissue. And then it's um, you know just good to be familiar with how this organism appears on cytology so that when you do come across it, if you do, uh, you'll, you'll uh, be able to, to recognize that. And PCR is the gold standard for making this diagnosis. 
And I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Porter, Dr. Wayne Crappie, Crappy, Dr. Karen Snowden, Dr. Jay Hoffman, and Kathleen Logan for their help uh, on this case series that uh, I had done back during my residency. Um, I just wanna make sure that they are acknowledged for their work. Um, and so I just wanted to share that case with you and I hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, I'm happy uh, to try and answer them. Uh, you can post them in the comments below um, and, uh, or you can uh, send me an email uh, anytime and I'd be happy to, to help you. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed uh, today's case and the, the background and uh, I'll see you next time. All right, take care, bye.